Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Yanir Baryam, president of Nexi, the New England Complex Systems Institute. Yanir is an MIT-trained physicist interested in the science of complex systems. He combines quantitative foundation in physics, computer science, and mathematics with computer simulation and high-dimensional data analysis to study collective behaviors and social challenges with the aim of informing better policies. Welcome, Yanir. Thank you so much for being on Technoculture. Thank you. The institute you lead, Nexi, is all about applying science to study social behaviors, emerging patterns, interdependencies, and so on. COVID-19 has been the number one social challenge besides a sanitary challenge during the past year and a half. You have single-mindedly focused on this, especially with your initiative endcoronavirus.org. Before we get to that, may I ask you something about complex systems, which I assume will also apply to your approach to COVID-19. So why is society effectively modeled as a complex system? Why are the tools of science appropriate to study behavior, social behaviors? So the main thing is because there are dependencies. And, and it may be surprising to many that the mathematics that underlies most of the science of that we have today doesn't actually have the capacity to deal with dependencies. Correlations that are present in statistics are not capturing what dependencies are about. And in fact, you can prove fundamentally that statistics is simply unable to deal with the nature of dependencies that exist in the real world. And the same thing is true of calculus. So the mathematical foundations we have are inadequate. And, and uh, what we need is a different set of mathematical tools that start from a different foundation. And, and this, one of the key uh, ways to understand this was discovered in physics uh, when the study of phase transitions in materials was what showed that calculus and statistics assumptions simply gave the wrong answer. They give mathematically the wrong answer. It literally, you ask a certain question and the, the, the math gives you a value of a half and the experiment gives you a value of close to a third. And so that shocked physics into discovering a new math that was identified by uh, Ken Wilson in 1970 for which he got the Nobel Prize. And, and the foundations of it are very different. And one of the key ideas that's super important to understand is that when you have a complex system, the most important challenge is figuring out what's important and what's unimportant. Because there are many, many dimensions in any complex system. And, and so, um, if you think about all of those dimensions, you will quickly get overwhelmed by the set of things that you would need to know. In fact, it's impossible to obtain that level of information about a complex system that you would need. Um, so the first step is actually to identify what's important and unimportant. And that's what the math that was developed by Ken Wilson does it shows us how to focus on the most important variables. And that enables us to build mathematical frameworks that are able to describe highly complex systems, not by trying to describe all of the details, but actually by starting by figuring out what's important and unimportant. Yeah, the selection of the relevant attributes of a system is something I wanted to ask you later on about COVID. Um, you mentioned a couple of concepts that I wanted to ask you about. For example, complex systems have a, a level of complexity. We often hear that we live in an increasingly complex world due to technological innovation, social interaction on a global scale, etc. But is it true that the world, the, the world's complexity is increasing, or it may be that it's our perception shifting so that the level of complexity of the world is constant and it's just our perception shifting? So part of the problem with that discussion is that complexity is not really a single number. And it's complexity of a system actually depends upon 
the level of resolution that you look at. So if you look at the earth from far away, you only see the orbit of the earth. That's pretty simple. That's described by very simple equations and very simple variables. But as you get closer, you see more and more detail. And so as you see more and more detail, there's more and more complexity. So complexity is not a single number. It depends upon scale. But what's happening is that because we're having more and more global interactions, the complexity of the scale of the world is increasing. And that comes along with various implications and, and complications that uh, we need to understand when we're thinking about what's going on in the world. All right. You are very active on Twitter and you have a huge following there. On September 4th, 2019, you wrote, complexity shouldn't be taken for granted. When it is present, there is a reason for it. What did you mean by that? I, I, the, the main point is that if you think about um, a, um, a uh, mixed bag of stuff, or if you look at some uh, still um, material, right? The, there is no high complexity. Again, going back to the Earth example, if you go to large scale, there isn't any complexity. If the Earth all of a sudden started jitterbugging around and, 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 and maybe the Earth went on a trajectory and, 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 and visited Mars and, and then went to Jupiter, right? Um, uh, its complexity would increase. Um, so when something happens, there has to be a reason for it. And, it, and in, in systems that we observe, there are these two different um, behaviors. There's the movement of the system as a whole, and then there are the internal movements of the system. And when we look at society and we see behaviors like fads or panics or so on, um, those have to be explained by the fact that people are talking to each other. There's interdependence in the system because otherwise everything would simplify. And in fact, that's the basis of statistics. Statistics assumes that you can average things together and not end up with any of these you know, behaviors like panics and fads. Statistics as a as a discipline doesn't have the tools, as we talked about a moment ago, to describe fads, panics, market crashes. And that's why in traditional econ economics, you, you actually cannot describe it. You can, you can talk about it empirically and say that there was a crash, but the mathematics to describe it is missing. And that's because um, uh, uh, economics has been based upon the mathematics of statistics and calculus and doesn't have yet incorporated into it the tools of complexity science except for in particular limited places where people have started to tease out how these how the understanding of the mathematics of complex systems influences economic behavior i shouldn't say yes. influences describes economic behavior. Yes, those disciplines crunch lots of data and probably expect to get answers from that. Let me get to the next question, which is about this, which is much of human inquiry today is focused on collecting massive quantities of data about complex systems with the assumption that more data leads to more insight into how to solve the challenges that face humanity. What's flawed with this assumption? So, so, so data helps, but unless you have assumptions that you validate, you'll never get enough data in order to describe any highly complex system because the amount of data you would need is combinatorial. It means you have to describe all of the different states of the, the possible states of the system and how um, they behave. So you can't do that. Right, you can't. There's no way to get enough data because it's it's huge amounts of data. So, even when people do machine learning and so on, they're making a statistical assumptions, uh, and so we're really limited to, you know, the data that we can collect about a system. And when you have dependencies in a system, 
there's no way to get enough data in order to describe all of the possible dependencies. So you need a framework that will enable you to find out what are the right dimensions. And again, going back to what we talked about before, that's what renormalization group, I didn't mention the name, uh, Ken Wilson developed the theory and the mathematics of renormalization group, which is a fundamental strategy that enables you to identify variables and then do validation of them uh, in this way. But without that, it's like um, the, the dimensionality of the system and the num amount of data that you need is so large. It's like, imagine that you were trying to describe all the cars in a city. And now, you know, the simulations have been done but what you do is someplace you put a pothole and the pothole is going to create this huge traffic jam that's going to affect much of the city. And you didn't even include the pothole in your model, right? So understanding the nature of the dimensionality of the problem is the beginning of any uh, analysis that will give you insight into the behavior of the system. Coming to COVID-19, how does a scientist like you, interested in social behavior, complex system, co systems, model a pandemic? Like, what kind of problem is a pandemic? So, first of all, the, the pandemic, like any other problem, has to do with the way, like any other complex system, has to do with the way dependencies exist, right? So, the 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 infection propagates through the network of people on Earth and how they're connected to each other specifically in the mechanism of transmission and related to how people behave and related to how people change their behavior as they're affected by the pandemic. And all of that is very clear if you think about it for a minute. But now the question is, what is the mathematics that you're going to use in order to describe this? And people who work in the field, they have to describe it using some form of a model. For example, R, the transmission rate, has to do with a model where you're assuming that the transmission rate as a number means something. I mean, the network is very heterogeneous, right? You're connected to your family and then your friends, and then there are other people over there and people are connected in different ways. Why would a single variable have anything to do with what's happening in the behavior of the system? And the answer is that it's making an assumption about how you average the connections in the system and only then does the variable R make sense as a way of describing what's going on. But that's an example. So now the question in a complexity frame as I've described it is, so what are the important variables that you need to include in describing the system? And it turns out that R, which is a super important variable is only one of variables that you need and in particular, there's one other one that you need can be described as the geographic spread. You can talk about it in terms of travel, how much travel there is in the system, how the intercommunity transmission, which is different from the within community transmission in the system. And so if you, if you just think about one R and not think about how the system separates into parts, then you miss a second super important variable in the system. And the third really important variable is actually the fact that the number of cases is discrete. So it's one, two, three, it's not 0 0.001 and 0 0.002 and so on. And, and this becomes very confusing because of course, if you have huge numbers of people and lots of infections, then it seems like the fraction of people that are sick is an important variable but it's really the number of infections that's important. And if we don't include that, then we miss something super important, which is the possibility of elimination. Because if you don't have discrete variables, you can never get to zero. So one of the real problems that we have with many of the models that people use is that structurally in the model, they've eliminated the possibility of elimination. And so the science has decided by virtue of its assumptions that we cannot get rid of the disease. 
And if you listen in the news and you listen in the press, that's what they say, because there are people who are convinced that you can't get rid of the disease. We have to live with it. And why? Well, there's a lot of it out there. Is there any real scientific explanation? That? No, it's nonsense. It's only an assumption that's already been baked into many of the models that people use. So, for example, in Australia, where people achieved elimination, they did it multiple times, right? Every little outbreak they had, they got rid of it. But when they had an outbreak that had 600 cases in Victoria, a lot of the professional public health and epidemiologists said, no, you can't eliminate it. We have to live with the disease. But there was an interdisciplinary complexity science knowledgeable group that put together models that showed that, yes, you could achieve elimination. And the government believed in this model. They probed it, talked to the people, and they said, oh, maybe it'll work. And they, they went after it, and they achieved elimination. And the key to all of this is always understanding the relevant variables. So imagine you're going to a car, and you want to drive the car, right? So if you don't know what the relevant variables are, maybe you'll start turning a tire or maybe you'll sit in the back seat or maybe you'll open the trunk. It's fun. It goes up and down, you know, but if you know what the relevant variables are, then you know that the steering wheel, the gas and the brakes and the gear shift are the most important variables that you need to understand. And that's even before you know how they work. But if you know that those are the right variables, then you know how to control the car you can figure it out, it makes sense. And the same thing is true about a pandemic. And the reason is that elimination becomes much, much more possible when you exert control over travel. That's obvious from what's happened in Australia and New Zealand and, 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 and Thailand. And even now, now when we have outbreaks in Taiwan and in Thailand, the reason that it broke down at least for, for now, hopefully they'll get back to getting to zero. But the reason it broke down has to do with the issue of travel control. Now, there's one more thing. I don't know if you want me to talk about it. I know that you probably want to hear about what's happening now and how we should think about this. Maybe, not necessarily. All right, you can I, ask me I any was questions. waiting for you to come to a natural stop to actually take a tiny step back because I followed you, but I think that I did not really understand, and maybe some listener too, what do you mean that the possibility of elimination is not in the model, we, we all hear that we want to get over the pandemic. We also hear that we will get there with immunity, like the virus will not go away. What do you mean? Can you explain that? No, because the, the current narrative that's dominant is that we're going to go to endemicity. What endemicity means is that the virus is still circulating in the population. It's going to come back and it's going to come back. It never will go away because like the flu, it's been around for, the reason is that many people study the flu and in the flu, it doesn't go away. So the models that they use are built into them that it doesn't go away. Um, and, and so the fact that there are other diseases that we've eliminated is being ignored because the people who study the flu don't study those other diseases. And by the way, it's really boring to write a paper that says, you know, okay, the disease went away, we're done. You know, Can I you mean, mention one? What one disease went one. away? When we say that a disease went away, I thought that it means that the pathogen is on earth, but that we are all immune or vaccinated. No, if we're we immune, little... that it actually just dies. Right. So what pathogens just um, what is, are extinct. Well, polio is gone. I mean, there are many diseases that are not present in one part of the world that are present in another part of the world, right? And the reason that that's true is that people have taken action and the actions that they've taken have included social distancing and vaccination and all kinds of other methods of making sure that, that it cannot propagate. It cannot go from place to place, from person to person. And, and when we do that well, you know, we pounce on, if there is a case, we pounce on it. You should read about how elimination has been done with other diseases. 
But the point is that if there's one case, everyone says, oh no, there's one case and we pounce on it. We make sure that nobody gets infected by it and we isolate people or we vaccinate them or we do whatever is needed. And we do it locally in the place where the people are. And so, so this is something that we know how to do but you know, people are, oh, there's too much, or maybe it's, you know, it's a respiratory virus, so it's gotta be like other respiratory viruses. No, the, the point is that once we understand what the relevant variables are, we know what we need to achieve elimination. And as soon as we can get cases to go down exponentially as we've done in many parts of the world, then really we have the ability to achieve elimination. And so we have, once people decide in their mind that they can't do something, have you ever tried to do something that you've decided that you can't do it? Yeah, I think so. It doesn't work <laughs> very well. You don't even try. Like, you know, I can't get that job. I'm not going to apply for it. Right? No, I'm never going to be able to climb that mountain. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to try. So of course, I'm not going to climb that mountain. So the self-fulfilling prophecy when there are goal-oriented things that you can do is super important. And so what's happened is that we've stopped ourselves from being able to be successful in fighting this disease. And as soon as you stop yourself from being successful at elimination, then people have these other ideas. We have to trade off between economics and the disease. So, I mean, it's all nonsense. The, the lower the disease, the less the economic impact, and that's been shown in many parts of the world, the easier it is to control, and you have the possibility of elimination locally and more generally. Because what you do is you eliminate it in an area, and then you eliminate it in another area. And right, we have Eastern Canada, which has eliminated the virus locally, and there's another province next door. So why don't they start carving off chunks of it and eliminating it progressively across the province? So that's the divide and conquer strategy that works. And if you think about, remember statistics, things about each variable, let's move this variable. Now let's move that variable. Now let's move that variable. So if you do that and you say, okay, let's get the cases down, but you don't include the travel restrictions, then it doesn't work. You have to do things, it's like, you know, all right, let's try the steering. Let's see what the steering does. Oh, it doesn't do very much. Now let's try the gas. What does that do? Well, you know, I backed up and forward in the driveway. That didn't do very much, right? But now if you include the steering and the gas, and of course you have to move yourself into gear. So you need to some do that too. All of a sudden you can drive. And, and that what the most frustrating thing is that we have a tremendous amount of, of disinformation and misinformation about what we can achieve together as a society. And it was really interesting. Um, Rory, I'm trying to remember his last name, a, a, a British politician in March of 2020. He said, why are people saying that the UK can't do what they did in, in uh, South Korea? We can definitely do it. And this is a very knowledgeable, experienced politician. So why are some people saying we can't do it and some people saying we can? And the answer is there are assumptions. Remember, it's really important to have the right assumptions in order to do something that you want to do. And, and all I've been doing for the last year and plus is just saying, once you understand what the control variables are, you all of a sudden realize that hey, we've been going back and forth in the driveway and we've been going, you know, doing this thing. Now just put them together and you can do it because we've done absolutely everything that we need in order to be successful. There's nothing that we haven't done in the United States, in Europe, everything's been done. It's just the sequence, it's the nuance of how we put it together. Right. Uh, you have been appearing publicly and sharing your guidelines, which are very clearly stated on the website and coronavirus.org. I did want to ask, 
Have you ever become frustrated during this year because your message has not really changed? You have been explaining what needs to be done. And yet, like you said, maybe we did it the wrong way. First, the steering wheel and just the gas. And we're still stuck somehow. So the personal question, isn't it frustrated that the world is just clumsy or not following what he says? And that's why we're not out of it. And also, do you think that at this point in the pandemic, your message needs to be updated depending on the evolution of the pandemic, that there are new guidelines, there's something new? Or no, the plan is always the same and it's clear and somehow simple if we just did it right. Yeah. So I don't know if frustration is quite the right word. I mean, the main problem is that people are suffering and dying. And, and somehow this is not being effectively communicated. The person who doesn't have it, uh, I mean, you know, I was reading about some, um, you know, super um, big spider, you know, something that grows like six inches or 12 inches spider. And I was saying, you know, I wouldn't want to be in the same room with that spider. People get really scared by it, but the spider is, you know, it has venom, it'll sting you, it'll hurt, it'll really, it might put you in the hospital, but it's not nearly as bad as this disease. It puts people on ventilators for, for weeks or months. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's a horrendous nightmare. And, 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 and a lot of people die from it, have serious consequences afterwards for their, you know, as far as we know, It'll be with them for their lives. And, and somehow we don't have this fear response. I mean, everybody should be super afraid of this disease. It's a terrible disease. And, and instead, we have all of these people are saying, no, it's not so bad. I mean, you know, some people get it less bad than others. That's true. But you wouldn't want to be in that room with that spider. And not, most people wouldn't either. And, and so that's one thing, I, really understanding why people are not reacting to it. It's tiring to tell people the same thing over and over again. There's a lot of other better things I would like to do. Now you asked what, would, what has changed? And the answer is we have an incredibly powerful tool, the vaccines now. We started them a few months ago and by now they're, you know, we've been able to vaccinate enough people so that you know, we can protect a lot of people. I mean, it's not perfect, you know, five to 10%. So, so somewhere between the risk has gone down by, by about a factor of 10 to 20 and less so for the new variants. And the new variants is the other thing that are making the transmission higher and they're more deadly and they affect children more. And, and it, I mean, it's a terrible disease. And, and the fact that it's less by a factor of 10, I think most people, if they understood what they were getting into by getting the disease, would really avoid it if they could. So, so what's changed is that it's actually easier right now to get rid of this. Remember the relevant variables, it's like, you know, instead of having, you know, now you have power steering or you have, you know, power brakes or whatever it is. We have something that gives us a lot more capability in driving this car. It's a turbocharged engine. Take your pick of what it's like. And all of a sudden what we're saying, okay, now that we have the turbocharged engine, we'll stop steering. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, and so what's happening is people are saying, well, we've decided that it's endemic. It's going to be endemic. So we're not going to try elimination, even if we have the super powerful tool. I mean, in many countries in Europe, the cases have gone down by a factor of over 20 in the last few weeks, a month and something. That's huge. The US is going down, even though they're opening up. That's huge. So, so why not take advantage of this to achieve elimination? And elimination, even without vaccines, could be done within a few weeks. But now we can do it much easier. We can do it maybe even just with masks, right? We don't have to do lockdowns. So instead of saying, oh, great, now we can celebrate and go out and party. We can do a, um, a dance and, and go to, um, you know, whatever. Um, we could just get rid of this. 
So, so that's what's changed. It's a lot easier to get rid of it. Now, if we get a vaccine evading variant, it will get hard again. But we have a window of opportunity now that we have enough vaccines to significantly affect transmission. And we still have all of these other tools that we've had since the beginning. Instead of saying, hey, we'd like to live with this disease for the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years or whatever, um, let's get rid of it. That's what's changed. You spoke about misinformation. One concept that I've heard you say was completely misinterpreted was that of the lockdown, which has been a huge keyword. Everybody was talking about the lockdown and you say we all got it wrong. How? So originally the word lockdown was used for travel restrictions in China. What they did is they stopped travel from uh, Wuhan to other parts of the country. So most of China, I mean, they, they shut down whatever, 40 million people, but look at all of China, it's a billion something people. And in most of China, there was either very few cases, so there was like four weeks of, of actual transmission or none, basically. Like Beijing had almost none. And so why did they do that? And the answer is if, if the disease never gets someplace, then you don't have to deal with it the same way, right? You just have a little bit to do rather than a lot. Whereas in much of the world, people just said, okay, we can't stop it, so we won't do this. So they did quote lockdowns where the cases went down because of restrictions on on uh, people interacting with each other, um, but they didn't prevent it from going from one place to the other. The second thing that they missed was also important. In the US, people said, hey, we did a lockdown, so it's gonna follow the same trajectory, we're gonna end up where China ended up. And that assumes that a lockdown has a lot of different pieces. It means a whole bunch of things. It means, you know, quarantining people who are close contacts, it means you know, um, aggressively identifying cases. It means, um, you know, making sure that uh, essential services are super safe and all of these things. China did a whole bunch of things. And as soon as they did okay in starting to get the cases going down, they didn't say, okay, we're done. They said, okay, what do we have to do more in order to get cases to go down even faster, right? Because what they understood and what New Zealand understood and, and very few other places understood is that the faster you get rid of it, the better. The more you can refine the ways you get rid of the disease and stop transmission, the shorter time, the fewer people are sick, the smaller the economic impacts, the less it affects our freedom. All of those things have been studied ad nauseum since the beginning of this outbreak. And the bottom line is, the best thing you can do is to get rid of it fast. Yes, well, Italy was among the, well, actually, it was the first European country to be hit. I'm Italian, though I was in New York in March 2020. And speaking to my friends and family in Italy, they were ordered to stay at home, not leave the house unless you need groceries and only one person can go. So who misunderstood lockdown first? Like policymakers, not just the people. Absolutely. That was it, well, I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about scientists and policymakers uh -huh. and everybody. Um, and it's called lockdown. It's not called stop travel orders. Lockdown gives this idea of shut things down, right. stores closed. And as an so, example, if I understand correctly, I mean, the Italian lockdown was one of the slowest declines of cases four months later, right? In China, it was done within six weeks, basically. And in, in, in Italy, it, it took four months and then it was still wasn't finished. And then the summer came, which helped. And then they opened up, so it went up again. But why did, why did it take so long? And one of the answers is that they didn't isolate people away from home. So they allowed a lot of transmission within families. And that's terrible. So people have this feeling, right? You don't want to take people away from their families. But if you're sick, you don't want to infect your family. 
So what people should have done is taken people out of their families and stopped the transmission. I've never understood in the US and Europe, not everywhere in Europe, some places they got it right, but in many places they're like, oh, the doctor sees you, sees you're sick. Okay, go home and isolate yourself at home and infects your whole family. How can doctors send people home to infect their family? I've never understood that. Go ahead, next question. I really wanna ask you this question. Um, so an important concept in identifying the relevant properties of a system is the separation of scales and to find the right level of analysis or the appropriate granularity to observe the phenomenon. How does this apply to COVID-19? I know it's a big question. I don't know if you can make it short. I assume that there are well, at I least mean, two scales, local and global, but maybe also two divide population in age groups or people with pre-existing conditions that need to be treated differently. So how many dimensions and how many scales does this problem have? How do you... Right. So this is one of those things where people have also gotten it wrong. They think that you can separate the society, you know, old and young and, you know, all kinds of things like that. And that doesn't work. What does work is separating geographically. So as a function of scale, what you want to know is the degree of connectivity between groups geographically. And we see that because, um, you know, we can have a village in Italy that says, I'm going to get rid of this disease and it gets rid of it. We have, you know, villages in India have now adopted a, a, an elimination strategy. We call it the green zone strategy, right? You get rid of it in one place and you protect it. And then you, you go and you protect other places and then you can progressively eliminate it. It's called confinement, right? The other idea is instead of having green zones, you confine progressively the disease so that it gets smaller and smaller in area. And, and so what's been happening is that people have done it the other way, which is that you have fewer cases. So they open up the, uh, you know, beauty parlors or they open up the restaurants or they open up the schools, one thing like that. And instead of doing that, you open it up by community. You say, this community doesn't have any cases. So we're going to open it up over here. And we're going to protect it. And then the other community is going to get rid of it. That's what they did in China. That's what they did in Australia. They have separation between states. They have separation within a city. They have separation within neighborhoods sometimes. And, and so if you separate it geographically, you can control it. And if you try to separate it by sector, there's no way to control it because the kids are going home and then the, the workers are going to uh, eat lunch and go to the beauty parlor or whatever it is. So you cannot separate it that way, but you can separate it by geography because you can reduce the transmission between geographical regions and that's how you control the disease. Last question about when we are over this pandemic, because eventually we will get there. Do you expect a post-pandemic era uh, going back to normal? And most importantly, what would you like to see happen? How does it look like the post-COVID time? So, so one of the things that's super important is that unlike other people, I never say we can't, I say we can Saying we can is very different from saying we can't. What it means is that if we choose to, then we will be able to. So it's not a prediction. Saying we can't is a prediction. Is it clear the difference? Saying we well, can't yes. means that we will never do it. The truth is, what I'm saying is that it's a matter of choice. And what we've seen is that we have the choice. The question is, what will we choose to do together? Because it's not a choice individuals can make. Yeah, so well, I appreciate what will happen, I... what will happen in the future, I don't know. But I can tell you that we can choose the future that we live in. And in the future that I think it would be good to choose, we've gotten rid of this disease and we can get together without fear of this horrendous disease affecting people. And we don't have to experience the horrendous nature of this disease, both of which are important, the fear and the reality of being infected. And if we do it, 
we can do it fast. It may take years if we, if we decide to ignore it. We may still be able to get there. Um, but the most important thing is we really need to understand, and this is not just for diseases, but for many things like, you know, people talk about climate change or people talk about, you know, destroying habitats or people talk about, you know, fisheries or so on and so on. Human, humanity, we together collectively have a lot of choices that we can make. And we, we have the opportunity to make good choices and bad choices. So let's decide to make better choices. Well, I appreciate the optimism in your answer, but uh, we have all at least 10 friends or people we know who thinks who think they are smarter than anyone and decided to sneak out and travel to go to that gathering they shouldn't have gone. So, you know, collectivity and us choosing is always us collectively, but yeah. as but, yeah. but part but, of a but, system. But, How do you... With some people doing the wrong thing, it still can work. We can still get rid of it. We don't need... Everything. Okay, that's need a everything. positive message. Yeah. Because well, it seems like... People have been, some people have been doing things right. And what kept us stuck in this situation is all the smarty pants who decided that secretly they were not going to I think do the right thing. I think the press has a tremendous responsibility in this context. They have carried the message of conflict. They, they sell uh, bad news, not good news. And the bad news of people in conflict and people unwilling to do stuff is, is mostly a made up myth. And the reason is you say that you have the friends that do it, but when people do polls, the vast majority of people want to do the right thing and to get rid of the disease. It's like 80%. It doesn't mean that there aren't people who don't want to do it. But the other part of it is that by elevating this nay, not doing it by talking it up in the press, it reinforces it. If we talk to people and we say to them, look, we have the possibility of getting rid of this. If you really want to go to bars and get together with friends and so on and, and had do all of the stuff you want to do, let's get rid of this. It only takes a few weeks. So I spoke with one of these people who said they were against lockdowns. And I said, we have a choice. We can get rid of this and then we can have parties the way we really want to have parties, like they're doing in New Zealand and in Australia when they don't have a localized outbreak. And why, why wouldn't we want that? Everyone does. It's not about the lockdown. This is the confusion. It's about the freedom that happens afterwards that matters. Right. So I would like to thank you very much for being so generous with your time. I'm happy we could do this interview because we were scheduled to do it in person last year, March 2020. I was in the United States and this I was I was going to fly out to Boston to meet you. And that was my first flight canceled due to COVID. The first of a handful of flights and interviews that got canceled or postponed due to COVID. And after a year, I decided to resume the podcast, even if I have to do it on Zoom, which was a pleasure to talk to you. But I hope that this freedom that you talked about that we had comes back because it's, you know, would be a pleasure to visit you in Boston. But thank you for being here today. It would be a pleasure to see you as well. And let's, let's hope that we get there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Take care.